Having looked at the duties of a fiduciary more generally, we're now going to be looking at the specifics of the duties of trustees. And there'll be a few parts this video because there are a number of different duties that are owed by trustees. The duties of trustees are more wide reaching and onerous than fiduciary duties. So as well as having a fiduciary duty, the trustees may also owe some other non-fiduciary duties. In other words, although there are some fiduciary obligations that the trustees will owe, which will give rise to a fiduciary breach if breached, there are some other duties of the trustees that are more wide-reaching, but will not amount to a fiduciary breach if breached, but just a mere breach of their duty. And this video really considers some of the most significant general duties which arise in relation to the operation of a trust. And Hudson says in his Equity and Trust book that there is no statutory list of the duties of a trustee. Hudson identifies a total of 12 duties, but other commentators may take a different view. So it is a remarkable feature of the law of trusts that there is no central statement of the duties owed by trustees in either a statute or in a single case. Rather, there is a sense of the obligations borne by trustees, which is expressed by the idea that trustees will bear those duties whenever conscience demands they do. There are some duties defined by statute, in particular under the Trustees Act 2000. In addition, in some types of trust, particularly in cases such as pension funds or unit trusts, additional duties may be imposed by statute. Now, a distinction needs to be made between a trustee's duties and his powers or discretions. And we talked a little bit about powers and discretions in a previous video, but a duty is an obligation which must be carried out, okay? The rules of equity require strict and diligent performance of a trustee's duties. On the other hand, a power is discretionary, okay? It may be exercised or it may not. So what are the duties of trustees. And for the purposes of this video and the following videos, this is the, the, the list that I'm going to use, although there may be slight variations between different people and different commentators. So we've got the duty to act in good conscience, to familiarise themselves with and observe the trust instrument, to exercise their discretion and consider their powers, to take care when dealing with the trust property, to take professional advice when required, to avoid conflict of interests, to avoid dealing with trust property on their own account, to act without remuneration except as allowed by the trust instrument, to act impartially as between beneficiaries, to act unanimously and jointly, to consider relevant matters and disregard irrelevant matters when making decisions and to provide information and an, and an account to beneficiaries. So this is what I'm going to be talking about over the next two or three or so videos. And I might not talk about them all, but we're going to go through them and ensure that you understand exactly what the duties of trustees are. So this is quite a long and onerous list of duties, but not all, not all of them are applicable all of the time, but most are. OK, so let's go through a few of them now. So the first one we're going to look at is the duty to familiarise themselves with the trust instrument. So it is no excuse for um, in an action for breach of duty to say you didn't read the trust instrument. So if you are appointed as a trustee, as a basic minimum, you should get hold of the trust instrument and actually read it. Okay. Once a trustee accepts the office of trustee, that trustee is bound by all the obligations in the trust instrument. So the general responsibility, um, or the general responsibilities, are for the trustee to familiarise him herself with the terms of the trust, the nature of the property involved, the range of objects within the contemplation of the trust, the identity of the other trustees, to consult all of the documentation connected to the trust and to familiarise herself with any other information pertinent to the management of the trust which is not recorded in a documentary fashion. Okay, And each trust each trustee is bound by all of the obligations in the trust instrument. So failure to obey the terms of the trust will constitute 
a breach of trust. And we got this case, uh, this quote from the case of Hallows and Lloyd, which says, this raises the important question, what are the duties of persons becoming new trustees of a settlement? Their duties are quite onerous enough and I'm not prepared to increase them. I think that when persons are asked to become new trustees, they are bound to inquire of what the property consists that is proposed to be handed over to them and what are the trusts. They also ought to look um, into the trust documents and papers to ascertain what notices appear among them of encumbrances and other matters affecting the trust. So this is just saying that they have to familiarise themselves with the trust instrument and other matters relating to the trust. So evidently then, the first obligation of trustees is one of general familiarisation with all of the issues connected to the management of the trust affairs. What a trustee, whether a new trustee of an existing trust or a trustee of a new trust cannot do is sit supinely by without investigating the nature and extent of her obligations as a trustee. Okay, it is important to bear in mind that a trustee will be liable for matters of which she could be expected to have knowledge. That is, as mentioned, the trustee is obliged to find out information about her trusteeship and not simply fail to investigate matters over which she is, she is expected to exert control. The other case I want to look at is Nestle and National Westminster Bank. Okay, and in this case, Nestle is actually a person, a man. Nestle uh, left a great deal of money under his will in the 1930s, and the money eventually went to his granddaughter. She was outraged to find that her rich grandfather was only worth a modest amount of money. It was a lot less than she expected and a lot less than its real value from when the trust was originally constituted. One of the reasons the trust fund had done so badly was because the bank did not use the full scope of its investment powers. It had left the money in safe trustee stock when in fact the trust instrument had given them the power to invest in potentially more profitable investments. And this is what Dylan had to say in this case. It was the duty of the bank to acquaint itself with the scope of its powers under the will. It is understandable that the bank had doubts on a mere perusal of Clause 13 as to its powers to invest in ordinary shares. It is inexcusable that the bank took no step at any time to obtain legal advice as to the scope of its power to invest in ordinary shares. So the trustee should have familiarised itself with the trust instrument and anything they didn't understand they should have taken legal advice on. Had they taken the legal advice, they would have realised they were allowed to uh, invest in potentially more profitable equities than they did. So there is a duty on the trustee to familiarise themselves with the trust. More specifically in this case, there was a duty on the trustee to familiarise themselves with the scope of the investments made by the trust. So although the granddaughter didn't win in the case in the end, it wasn't for this particular reason. The trustee is obliged to familiarise themselves with the trust instrument. And each trustee is bound by all of the obligations in the trust instrument too. So failure to obey the terms of the trust will constitute a breach of the trust. In general terms, a trustee does not have powers which are more extensive than those set out in the trust instrument. However, one clear exception to this principle arises in circumstances in which there is no trust instrument or in circumstances in which the trust instrument is silent on a particular point. Okay, so let's look at another duty. And that is the duty for trustees to exercise their discretion and consider their powers. So where a trustee has discretion, they must exercise that discretion. If you don't remember discretion and what that entails, make sure you check out my video on that, which I shall link below the video. So a failure to carry out an action required by the trust or the performance of an unauthorised action will constitute a breach of trust. So a failure to exercise their discretion will constitute a breach of their duty. Now, in McPhail and Dalton, 
It was said that if the trustee fails to exercise their discretion, the court can compel them to exercise the trust. Now, in this case, someone left money on trust for the benefit of the staff of a company and their dependents. The trust deed gave the trustees a discretion in the distribution of the trust property. So if the trust uh, is to be divided between some people in a manner which the trustees can decide is in their discretion, then they have to exercise that discretion and the court will make them do so if they don't. And we've also got the case of Relocker's Settlements Trust from 1978 and in this case there was a discretion too. Money was settled on trust with the income to be distributed annually to such beneficiaries as the trustee should determine. On the instructions of the settler, the person who created the trust, the trustees retained the income for three years. In other words, the trustees of a discretionary trust did not make any distribution for a number of years based upon the expressed wishes of the settler. This can put trustees in a difficult posi um, position because once the trust is created, the settler has no power and drops out the picture completely. The trustees owe no duty to the settler and really should disregard what they say. However, where the person is the provider of all the trust income, the trustees may understandably think it is the settler's money really and so may feel obliged to give effect to his wishes but this is not the way it works. So in this case when they the trustees obeyed the wishes of the settler instead of the trust document they were actually in breach of trust and this is what Golding said in the case. A court of equity where trustees have failed to discharge their duty of prompt discretionary distribution of income is concerned to make them, as owners of the trusts, um, trust assets at law, dispose of them in accordance with the requirements of conscience, that is, to give benefits to the SESDK trust in accordance with the confidence that the settler reposed in them, the trustees. So this is really just a long-winded way of saying that the court will follow the instrument and enforce the trust instrument and not the will of the settler and the trustees must do the same thing. Okay, In the case of mere powers, where there is no obligation to exercise the power, the trustees are still obliged to consider whether to exercise the power. So even though there is no obligation to exercise its powers, the trustees make, must consider whether or not to exercise those powers. And as McGarry says in Rehay Settlement, a mere power is very different. Normally the trustees is not bound to exercise it and the court will not compel him to do so. That, however, does not mean that he can simply fold his hands and ignore it, for normally he must from time to time consider whether or not to exercise the power and the court may direct him to do this. So the court cannot make them exercise a power, but they can make the trustees think about it. So a beneficiary of a power could get a court order to ensure the trustees consider the exercise of a power, um, but really that's as far as it goes. The court cannot and will not make them exercise a mere power. And finally, to wrap up this video, we're going to talk about Turner and Turner, which is also concerned with the exercise of discretions and powers. And in this case, a farmer transferred his property to a trust for the benefit of his wife and children. He appointed his father and other family member members, none of whom had any knowledge or experience of trusts, as trustees. He later instructed the trustees to make appointments of the property. As the trustees had not considered the powers and whether they should be exercised, but had simply followed the instructions of the settler, the appointments were held to be a nullity. So, in this case, trustees of a discretionary trust simply followed the directions of the settler without appreciating that they had a discretion um, and therefore didn't actually exercise that discretion. Consequently, their actions were held to be a nullity and they were therefore required to exercise their discretionary power and in a manner appropriate to fiduciaries. So this is another case where the trustees listen to the settler and not the trust instrument. You have to listen to the trust instrument if you are a trustee. Okay, so that wraps up the first couple of trustee duties that we're going to look at. But we're going to have a number of 
um, other du duties to look at as we saw from that long list that I showed you at the beginning of this video. So make sure you check back in to part two, part three, possibly part four, I'm not too sure yet. And if you have any questions about this video, then make sure you leave a comment below and I'll get straight back to you. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and subscribe to my channel and I shall see you next time. Thank you very much for watching.